Splinter Cell 1 was the first one on the market to bring this new genre. It really defined the genre, uh, action stealth. And, and for us now, it's about taking that genre and pushing it you know, further. When we started working on Conviction, um, we approached it uh, with a lot of respect because Splinter Cell is a huge brand. I love the old Splinter Cells, but it was time to kind of do something new. We did our own work, so we played, uh, we replayed all the, the Splinter Cell games. We played all our uh, all the other uh, games and the genre. As I was playing them, I found them to be a lot frustrating. Uh, I didn't feel like the guy that 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 I was supposed to be. In reality, that kind of fantasy of playing like a, you know like this kind of stealth agent, if you're spotted, it shouldn't be like mission failure. You know, like it should just be that kind of next step of the evolution of the action. With Conviction, we brought this new layer of action. Stealth games, they can be permissive and they can be spectacular. And how we do that, it's by allowing players to go into an action loop and then come back into stealth. The gameplay loop uh, that we have in um, Spinner Cell Conviction is uh, what we call PEV. Prepare, execute, and vanish. It perfectly describes uh, the new gameplay that we uh, are bringing forward. It's not you play stealth or you play action, you play both at the same time. What we're really allowing you to do now is approach these missions however you want. This is what I want to do, this is where I want to go. Bang, I do it. If you approach the enemies in a stealthy fashion, you can then be rewarded with a mark and execute. Mark and Execute is a new gameplay system that we've created for Splinter Cell. And uh, the core philosophy is basically having the player able to kind of master like uh, Sam's skills. Like you have classic scenes in movies when people breach a room, pull the pistol out, bang, 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 three shots, we'll kill three guys. We want the player to be able to experience that kind of thing. Basically, when you're in the shadows, you can observe the enemy and prepare uh, your plan or your tactic. You have a look around, see which enemies you want to target, bang, click uh, the right bumper, mark appears on his head, go for the next guy, mark appears on his head, and then at any time you want, when you're in the right position, press Y, and then you'll unleash like a barrage of bullets at these guys. You can even mark lights, all different objects. Being able to orchestrate the battle, then being able to orchestrate the, the, the attack in a very feral, predator way uh, that uh, just makes this game uh, amazing. Everyone is still finding new and cool ways to use Mark and Execute. We're doing it fast because we want you to feel like a predator, like a, like a panther. You got Sam moving in such a way that he never moved before. He's just doing moves that are just powerful. You know, you get seen by the enemies, they start shooting at you, they start engaging you. And then, if you want, you just turn a corner, you hide in the shadows, you break the line of sight with your enemies. And then automatically, what we do is uh, we, we make appear your silhouette, your last known position. The last known position, it is, uh, it's a visual representation of where the enemies like, last saw you. Like a figure of you will appear there, like a ghostly kind of figure. And what that does is it tells the player, good job, first of all, you've broken line of sight with the enemy, they don't know where you are. But also what it does is that it tells, it tells you that the enemy is gonna concentrate on that last known position. So you know where they're going, you know where they're looking. So you can flank them, you can ambush them, so you can really play with them the way a, a cat would play with a mouse. The hardcore Splinter Cell fans and the hardcore shooter fans are gonna really appreciate what we've done. It's just so cutting edge and I was blown away. We're really happy with what we have. I think we have a unique mix of, um, of stealth and action. Storytelling's great. Even more fun and high impact. That is finally a game that everybody wants to play as a stealth action game. The story for Splinter Cell Conviction uh, takes place shortly after the events of Double Agent. It opens up with Sam investigating his daughter's death. Playing the other games and looking at where the storyline was taking Sam, it felt very natural that Sam would not be working for Tradition anymore, that he'd be working on his own. Sam today 
not being part of third echelon anymore. He doesn't have the rules of conduct that he initially had when being part of this organization. So now he makes his own rules. So picture it. Sam Fisher is the best agent that ever was. He's the strongest infiltration agent. Now he doesn't have any laws to contain him. He doesn't have any orders to follow. And he's enraged. Who are you working for? So making a story more about Sam allows us to talk more about his history. Uh, and also it allows us to, to create some gameplay that has a different flavor than before. Okay, la grosse différence qu'il va y avoir entre les anciens Speed Tercel et les nouveaux uh, Conviction, c'est surtout au niveau de la vélocité du personnage, au niveau de sa brutalité. Donc en fait, on a dû euh, trouver un art martial qui, qui vraiment correspondait au personnage et à la situation dans laquelle on va se retrouver. Donc quelque chose de très efficace, très rapide, brutal et qui n'a pas de règles. Donc c'est le Krav Maga qu'on a choisi pour ça en fait. Krav Maga is not a, uh, a big flashy martial art, you know, he's not going to be doing spinning back kicks or anything like that. What he is doing is he's being extremely efficient at taking people down in a fast and effective manner. Secondarily, Sam is like extraordinarily capable with a pistol. So we've gone to a lot of effort of studying different close quarter combat techniques, uh, different ways of fighting with a pistol. So for instance, our basic stance is uh, actually the center axis relock, like this. It gives you a lot of advantages to be able to, to fire like this continue firing, fire, 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 like that. So we have a very fast and fluid system for being able to move in different directions like that. There is no walking away from us, Fisher. We made you, we own you, and we always will. He's left third echelon, so he's on his own. So you'll find a couple of gadgets that he'll improvise in the gameplays. So we have a snake cam mirror that we use that he, it's actually an improvised version of the old snake cam is a mirror that he's going to use at the early stages of the game. Um, we still have uh, gadgets where uh, he'll be able to disrupt lights, but the realization this time around is a lot more action-based, so you'll have uh, EMP grenades and EMP devices that'll help you really uh, create a path of shadows, uh, like the previous Miller cells, but with a 2009 a special effects turn on it. Hey, asshole. Remember me. We're in Los Angeles and we're getting ready to do the first voiceover session with, you know, with, with Sam Fisher. And so as soon as he opened his mouth, you know, <laughs> I got chills. I was like, shit, man, that's Sam Fisher in that booth. I have a message to those who stand in my way. Pray. He's a predator, very visceral emotions he's feeling, and it's really portrayed throughout the gameplay. That's the Sam Fisher we have now, an honest, yet dangerous badass. The story is about Sam Fisher. First, he's looking for his daughter's killer. Third Echelon is in that. Third Echelon is a company that Sam Fisher used to work for. Uh, and this is a group of rather sneaky individuals. They're a section of the, the US government that, you know, it, it's proper, like, behind closed doors. And, you know, people ask about Third Echelon, they're like, I've, I've never heard of them. I don't know what you're saying. The threat that we wanted with this story is a threat that is technology-based. Sam Fisher is forced to investigate that. That investigation will lead him to Washington, where uh, he's going to have to face a much bigger threat. This is bigger than your daughter. This is bigger than both of us. The people behind this, you can't hide from them. Tom Reed is a, an interesting character. Um, he is the new head of Third Echelon. Who's the guy that will dump bodies for the good of the country. This guy steps over the limit. Like, he has no problem with taking out US citizens in order to get the job done. This is John. Panther has been secured. I repeat, we have secured Panther. Affirmative. We have uh, Grimm. Uh, who's back in, in, in the game. She was the voice in Sam's ear in all the past Splinter Cells. Now she's chief technical advisor in Third Echelon, one of the main officers for Tom Reed, who's now the head of Third Echelon. She's kind of the former friend, the former uh, helper. Now she's giving him orders. She's asking him to do things that he doesn't want. And Sam doesn't know exactly what to think about her. 
We have Cost, Victor Cost, who's uh, Sam's best friend. Sam Fisher, you knew he's dead. America killed him, asked him to make one sacrifice too many, cross one line too far. Sam and Cost friendship goes back to the Navy SEAL days, I will say 20, 25 years ago. He comes back into the story and kind of saves the day and gives Sam information that's really vital and really key elements to the nucleus of this game. He caught a whisper in the wind that maybe his daughter's death hadn't been an accident. In Splinter Cell Conviction, Sam is going to get to fight all kinds of enemies, ranging from your basic thug or henchman who are reckless and will run in without much consideration, all the way up to, you know, uh, your trained elite agents and your Splinter Cells. So you'll be fighting almost against a mirror image of yourself. For the first time, you'll feel what it's like to be one of those NPCs hunted by a Splinter Cell. Someone in the United States won't create chaos. When you look at it, Splinter Cell 1 was a benchmark when it came out, and Splinter Cell 3 was probably the best looking game of the last generation of consoles. So it was extremely important for us that when we released our Splinter Cell Conviction, that it came out as strong. We came up with a bunch of things that uh, are super interesting. So the first thing that we have um, is what we called uh, projected text. So basically what we're doing is we're integrating in the environment the objectives that we're giving to the player. We'll actually be telling you what's happening or the information you wanted to know. We'll be seeing uh, flashbacks or things projected on the walls that will explain that. So everything is integrated in the environment and it allows you to tell the story without taking the control from the player. So what San is thinking, what's happening somewhere else in the world, it's displayed while you're playing, while you're, you're, you're still immersed into the game. It's Corbett, Andre Corbett. One of the visions of never taking the controls away from the player is actually to not feel the loadings. But Sam knew Corbett was in there. You're gonna go from one location to another. We're gonna hide the loading as much as possible. From one location, the camera's gonna go in. You know, we're gonna play a movie while we're loading. You're gonna arrive in the other location, and it's all gonna be seamless. Never at a time will you be just staying there and waiting for something to happen. And another thing that we're really proud of is what we call our uh, interrogation sequences. Some people in the game, you're going to have to interrogate to move the story forward and get some information. And we've created a whole system that allows you to bash people. And also, we have a damage system. So the more you beat up the guy to get information, well, the more he's going he's gonna to show like he's, he's beaten up. It gets a little violent, but it gets the job done. We wanted to have a unity of time and location because we find that that makes it a lot more personal for players. It's more interesting story-wise because the events are, are unfolding a lot faster. So Washington was a very interesting uh, location for us because obviously it's the, it's the heart of, of the United States. Uh, it's also a very interesting location for Sam Fisher. He was working for the, the U.S. government. The idea that uh, Sam is facing his former agency home it was very interesting from a, a character perspective. We took a lot of risk when we approached the design for this. We came up with a whole uh, bunch of new design elements that have never been done before in any other game. And uh, the day that all those elements came together was fascinating. It finally allows players to feel like the most elite spy agent in the world, be in control of him, and be able to do the things that they expect he should be able to do in those situations. got a month left so uh, I hope we're fine I hope we're fine it's uh, it's this balance of uh, being positive and all was always wanting better quality right yeah right. we're actually sending the first um, video walkthrough to Microsoft today so I'm in the process of writing up the, the build notes to make sure that uh, uh, everything's clear and they know what we're working on and all that stuff it's looking good I'm happy with it so these are the boards from the actual opening of the E3 sequence. Sam uh, getting information about Coben when he's beating the crap out of that guy in the bathroom there. Context-wise, that sounds a little bizarre. These are storyboards for the ending of the game, so I'm not sure I can actually show these to you. Until E3, next week is the last week for the animators. <laughs> yep, big week of polish.
you better start working. Very good. <laughs> Very good. It's a scripted scene from the E3 demo. So I'm animating the main character, uh, Sam Fisher. I'm an animator. I'm uh, doing the interrogation. Working with some mocap that was shot at the studio. <laughs> I'm working on uh, headshots. We're working hard, but yeah, confident. Don't today. On? Thank you. <laughs> How's it the camera going? Um, it's going. It's happening. I'm more concerned about my lunch right now. Um, that I'm looking forward to eating, and it's gonna have a beer with it as well. Just go, really not good yet. just go away. Otherwise, oh, Murphy will have a beer. As he continues to <laughs> murmur to himself. No, <laughs> really? <laughs> <laughs> Are you filming for real? <laughs> really? Yeah, okay. see you. I'm working on the menus and uh, Ehud. We have a presentation uh, later this afternoon, and I'm trying to uh, see if it works. So, Z, Microsoft presentation, the first time it's being shown? Uh, yeah, first time it's being shown in a, in a long while, so I'm uh, really excited, a bit nervous. We'll see how it goes. But we had, uh, we had a very good version yesterday, so that got us uh, really excited. So how's the E3 demo going so far? Uh, I, I don't want to say too much to ruin surprises, but uh, you'll be very pleased to see what we've done with what, what they've done and what we've tested with Sam Fisher. And this is a part of my job I love very much, making sure that everything works. And I do mean everything. So much work was done on this game. As you can see the projections, it's a 3D text, it's pretty cool. We've integrated the actions right onto the objects. There's a lot of different things to test to make sure that they work fine. Every little thing that could make the experience less enjoyable for the people at the E3. Cheers. We got our video for Microsoft done today, so we're very happy about that. Uh, heading into a month of polishing, so well positioned for a kick-ass demo, I think. <laughs> the, the full walkthrough is supposed to last five minutes, and right now we're at seven. So um, it's a lot to cut. Maybe there's another team that's presenting at E3 and they're missing uh, two minutes. Assassins might be short. If they're short, we're, um, we've got two minutes for them, definitely. Where are we? We are at the airport. Is it early? Obviously. <laughs> Where are we going? We are going to LA. For what? I am a robot. <laughs> <laughs> for E3. I think we've got too many people of the team on this flight. If something happens, I think the project might be uh, Air Canada, in a bit of trouble. But I think it's going to be fine. We're going to have a good flight. See you in LA. With all remaining customers, please board. It's going to go just amazing. You guys are going to do an outstanding job. Room service! <laughs> trying to. Uh, Get the perfect walkthrough that feels ultra dynamic, ultra stealth, and inside the timing that we're required to follow. Sam can use any part of the environment. It's all interactive and destructible. Rehearsing, rehearsing, and rehearsing. <clears throat> Until my fingers bleed. We're gonna go to, um, to rehearse for the uh, Microsoft press conference. You, you can't come in because the security is too crazy. We're put into a room, and then we wait for our turn, and then they put us back into the room afterwards. A windowless room. No way that camera's going in. So we're excited. We're excited to uh, to uh, unveil Splinter Cell to the rest of the world tomorrow and, and get the first reactions. The feedback we're, we're getting is good, so tomorrow's going to be a great day. The game is ready already. We've got the drive. We can go to Microsoft. Microsoft press conference uh, showed the demo for the first time. Uh, I didn't know playing the game could be that stressful <laughs> on the stage. It was crazy, but I'm pretty happy with how it went. We started reading the comments of the 
the people on the forums, the feedback is really, really good. So we're really excited about that. And now uh, we're at uh, the Ubisoft press conference venue and we're uh, gonna rehearse the first time and then uh, it's gonna be the real show again. Just going into my uh, dress room now. So I'll see you guys later. Hey, so they just opened the doors. They're letting everyone in. It looks like it's getting pretty full. We're about to start. Well, it's all come down to this. We're getting ready, trying to fit the mics and setting up the TVs. So it's like in a couple of minutes now, everybody's going to come in here. It's the last second of preparation. We're just trying to <laughs> make sure everything's ready. We're opening the doors in, uh, I don't know, a few minutes. Everything's almost ready. We're ready to have a great first day of E3. Splinter Cell Conviction! Again, super cinematic, a little slow mo. You see the guy die. Oh, that's great. That's yeah. Great. All movie angles, too. We're trying. Really We're trying. Good, really good <laughs> filming angles. Will you send me one? We will. Okay. I'm sure someone of Ubisoft will do that. Wow. <laughs> good stuff. Hi, my name is Patrick Redding. I'm the game director for Splinter Cell Conviction Multiplayer here in Ubisoft Montreal. Splinter Cell Conviction is setting out to reinvent the franchise for Splinter Cell, to reinvent how people think about stealth action and stealth action gameplay. It was really important for us to be able to transfer that over to the multiplayer experience as well, to really give players a chance to feel like an elite rogue agent who's been let off the leash, who's been freed from those rules of engagement, has been given the ability to strike at will at his enemies from the shadows. Uh, we want to make sure that players were able to work together to experience that as well. And that's why we arrived pretty quickly at the idea that it should be a cooperative game, that it should be two players working together uh, kind of in tandem as these two agents. We call our co-op story campaign the prologue because it's literally a prequel to the storyline of Sam Fisher that we see in single player. The two player characters in the co-op game are actually still agents working for their respective agencies. And for the first time, possibly for the first time in the Clancy universe, we actually have a team up between two agents that are working from what would normally be rival agencies. So what we have is uh, Archer, who's an American agent working for Third Echelon, Sam's old employers. And we have Kestrel, who's a Russian agent, a Russian operative working for Voron. And Voron's essentially kind of the Russian Third Echelon. It's a division or a special project within the SVR. We have four additional game modes, which make up what we call Deniable Ops. Those four modes are Hunter, Infiltration, Last Stand, and Face Off. Uh, the idea is we're taking the four maps from the prologue storyline, uh, these four maps that are in the former Soviet Union, and then two additional maps that are specific to the Diable Ops missions, uh, and giving players a chance to try three different difficulty levels, a whole lot of the different weapons and elements that, and ingredients that we've introduced uh, throughout single player and co-op, and try it either by themselves or with a friend. People are playing in multiplayer experiences and co-op experiences, not just online. Uh, so we want to make sure that we're always supporting the ability for people to you know, link together on Syslink, but also to play split screen at home. So in addition to the story campaign, which is represented by Prologue, we have four additional game modes, which make up what we call Deniable Ops. Those four modes are Hunter, Infiltration, Last Stand, and Face Off. <laughs> So Hunter mode is basically an elimination mode. You're entering a particular zone of one of these maps. It's about 15 to say 30 minutes worth of gameplay. And your objective is take out all of the enemies in the area.
if you slip up or if you get a little too noisy, maybe you're not as stealthy as you need to be, of course reinforcements will show up and that makes things a lot more difficult. We also want to make sure that players have a chance to pit those skills against one another. So we've introduced an adversarial mode, spy versus spy, we call it face off. And the concept is that these two agents are stalking each other in the shadows, as you might expect. But in order to add a certain element of strategy to it and make things a little more complicated, there's also an enemy AI element. Last Stand is really something new for the Splinter Cell world. It's, it's basically a survival mode. Our agent or agents are tasked with protecting uh, an object of some value. In this case, it's an EMP warhead that's destructible. And the AI enemies that are coming into the world uh, have really one core objective, and that is to take out that EMP warhead and destroy it, to damage it to the point where it's not repairable. <laughs> Infiltration, I like to think of as our gift to the loyal Splinter Cell players, the people who've been with the franchise from the very start. It's pure stealth gameplay, which means if you get detected, it's game over. And as you would expect, we introduce a lot of security ingredients into that mix. So we see cameras, we see turrets, we see lasers, all of these elements which help make things a little more difficult for the players are trying to move through this space without getting spotted. Tango down, neutralized. We want to reward the players that are being the completionists and are exploring every corner of the game. Uh, and one of the ways that we can do that is by creating special challenges around all of that gameplay and then rewarding players to complete those challenges with points. We call this the Persistent Elite Creation System. It's something which will be familiar to people who've played some of our recent Rainbow Six titles. And the idea behind that is by earning these points, which I can do either in single player or in co-op, I'm able to go into special environments, either the locker room in our lobby uh, or some of the weapon stashes that we find throughout the game world. Um, any weapon that I've already unlocked through the normal progression of gameplay, I can then upgrade. That means I might be able to add a silencer, a laser, a scope, a special stock. I can also upgrade the efficiency and the effectiveness of my gadgets, whether you're talking about visualization tools or grenades. Other things include personalizing the appearance of my avatar. Uh, but at the same time, there's a gameplay component to that because I can add accessories. I can change the capacity for carrying ammunition or carrying gadgets. I can basically increase the amount of armor that I have on my person to make myself more resistant to damage. So there's a gameplay component to it as well. And this is really a way of rewarding those players, whether they start in single player or they start in co-op, whether they're playing deniable ops mainly or they're playing the story mode, a way to kind of reward them for completing these challenges and really diving deep into that gameplay. We're always aware of the fact that, you know, people are playing in multiplayer experiences and co-op experiences is not just online. Uh, so we want to make sure that we're always supporting the ability for people to you know, link together on Syslink, but also to play split screen at home. Players really love the dynamics of having to work together, to having to really collaborate. So it's not co-op in the sense of having two solo players who happen to be in the same map at the same time. It's really co-op in the sense of these two agents need to work together and they need to coordinate their actions. They need to communicate with each other in order to be able to get through this, either without being detected or, or even just to survive it. If Sam Fisher is the Panther, then these two guys, Archer and Kestrel, they're really two wolves in a pack.